If you have a copy of the Word of God with you tonight, I, don't, I want you to turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I simply want to read one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You find it in, in verse 20, the 20th verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes this, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Amen. Let's pray. Father, how sweet it is for us to sing of the love of Jesus Christ. How marvelous is your love to us in your Son. How extravagant is your love to us in your Son. We bless you. We extol you. We glorify your name tonight for all that you are and for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ and continue to do for us through him. We bless you that we are gathered here tonight as a covenant community of your people to once again enjoy the fellowship of the saints, the ministry of the Word of God, and to observe together the Lord's Supper. We would pray that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit and minister to each and every one of us this evening, that we might be encouraged in our souls, strengthened in our faith, renewed in our repentance, caused afresh to delight in our God and to live for our Savior. O oh, blessed God, come now, we pray. Hear us. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. The moment our Lord's public ministry began in Israel, Mark tells us that he declared that the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God was at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In Matthew's gospel, we have five discourses, all of them centering upon the subject of the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, our Savior declares that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be added unto us. When Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, came to our Savior by night, Jesus told him that unless you are born from above, you cannot see and you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a major theme in the teaching of Jesus. It's also picked up in the writings of the apostles. Writing to the Roman Christians, Paul declares in Romans 14 verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And writing to the Corinthians in the text that I read to you this evening in 1 Corinthians 4.20, Paul declares, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk or in word, but in power. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of the kingdom of God. I want to particularly think about it from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20, where Paul tells us that the kingdom of God does not consist in word, but in power. In this text, Paul is addressing an important matter, an important matter that I want you to think about with me this evening as we come again to the Lord's Supper as God's people. It is the stark difference between being merely religious and being a true Christian. The dramatic contrast between being 
Someone who talks about religious things and someone who possesses Christ in your heart. Paul is contrasting here, I believe, mere religiosity with true Christianity by saying that the kingdom of God does not consist in word, but in power. He wants us to recognize, as the rest of the New Testament bears witness, that the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality that brings us out of the world of sin into the realm of the rule of God in our hearts. And so this evening, brothers and sisters, as we take time together to prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's Supper, I want you to think with me for a few moments on this subject of the kingdom of God. And I want you to think with me with regards to this subject of six truths that I believe the New Testament sets before us regarding the kingdom of God consisting of power. Or if you like, the work of the Spirit in our hearts. We just had a conference recently, a wonderful conference with Dr. Hamilton on the ministry of the Spirit. It's had me thinking in a hundred different directions. It just so happens that in one of my readings, I've been thinking this through, that this whole topic has come to my mind again. And I thought, well, let me experiment with the congregation tonight. I'll preach a message on the kingdom of God and the ministry of the Spirit in our hearts by way of meditation for the Lord's Supper. Six truths about the kingdom of God spoken by our Lord and His apostles to help us understand, to help us evaluate, to help us think through the reality of what it means to be a true Christian and not just a religious person. First of all, I want you to notice that the kingdom of God has a king. Now, that might seem very elementary, but it needs to be said, right? The kingdom of God has a king. Who is the kingdom of God's king? Who is the king in the kingdom of God? Well, there's a clue in the statement, kingdom of God. God is king in his kingdom. Now, of course, God is king over all things. He rules over all all the universe, right? He is the creator of the whole world and all that is in it. He's the creator of the whole universe and the sustainer and the upholder of all things. But in a particular special way, redemptively speaking, God is king in the kingdom of God. God rules by His Spirit in His kingdom. Now, what do we mean by God rules by His Spirit in His kingdom? We're talking here about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who is God, working in a particular realm through the mediation of Christ at the behest of the Father, right? All three persons of the triune Godhead are involved in the kingdom of God. And when we talk about God then ruling as king, We need to understand that we're talking here about a kingdom that is spiritual. That's why when Jesus bursts onto the scene, it's God coming into the world and declaring the kingdom of God. The rule of God has now come in the person of Christ and is going to be established as we're going to think about this evening. Uh, The apostle Paul, of course, discovered something of this when the kingdom of God apprehended him on the way to Damascus. Christ, the king, revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus to deliver him out of the kingdom of darkness that he was living in into the kingdom of the light, the marvelous light of the Son of God. So when we think of This kingdom, we must first and foremost think of its king. We're talking here about God's rule. We're talking here about God's domain. We're talking here about God's realm of redemption in particular. And so we need to recognize then when we think about being in the kingdom of God, we're thinking about God actually being in us by His Spirit. Christ dwelling in our hearts by His Spirit. 
Christ is king. God is king in the kingdom of God. If Christ is not enthroned then in our hearts, we are not Christians. If Christ is not enthroned in our hearts as Lord, we are not saved. And this is what we need to understand about this kingdom that is spoken of in the New Testament. Now, what is the, what is the subject of this kingdom of God? Well, of course, it's the hearts of men, right? Where does Christ reign in our lives? He reigns in our hearts. That is to say, in our souls. Christ has come by the work of the Spirit, through the ministry of the gospel, the, the good news preached to take up residence, if you will, in our souls. There was a time when we were walking about in this world in our own wisdom and our own understanding without hope and without Christ. But as Paul discovered on the road to Damascus, Christ apprehended us by the power of the Spirit through the ministry of the gospel and came into our life to transform us from the inside out. Before we entered the realm of God's rule in our lives through faith in Christ, we were living in rebellion. We were in a state of anarchy. We were in a state of confusion, alienation, enmity from God. Some of you will remember that more than others because you spent many years in the world without hope and without Christ. Some of you, you don't remember it all that much because you became Christians in Christian homes and your experience is different. But irrespective of when you became a Christian, there was a time you were outside of God's kingdom and there was a time you came into God's kingdom. And when we think then of the subject of God's kingdom, we're thinking here particularly tonight of our own hearts, of our own soul. When God, by His Spirit, took away the scales from our eyes, unplugged the deafness of our ears, changed our hearts of, flesh, hearts of stone, and gave us hearts of flesh. For some of you, it was very dramatic. For some of you, it was very traumatic. For others of you, it was just like Lydia, and the flower opened, and there it was. You had come out of darkness into light. But nevertheless... If Christ has not come into your heart, if by the Spirit Christ has not taken up residence in your soul, if by the Spirit you have not been born from above, you have not yet entered the kingdom, and you are not yet a Christian. And you can learn all the language, all the words. You can know all the rituals and all the ceremonies, and you can have lots of friends who are also professing Christians. And yet you can merely be religious and not truly a child of the kingdom of God. And I want you to think about that. I want you to consider that. There are many people in America tonight who claim to be Christians, but have never experienced the new birth, never been born from above, have never experienced the king entering their heart by the power of his spirit through the ministry of the gospel and are yet therefore outside of this kingdom. Is that you tonight? Does that describe you? It could even describe you in terms of being a member of IBC. You can fool me. I'm easily fooled. You can fool Steve. He's not so easily fooled, but he's still fooled. You can fool Chuck or Joe or Brother Rick. You can fool the congregation, right? Say the right things. Get the language right. Engage in the right ceremonies. And yet not have Christ enthroned in your heart. Not have the Spirit of God dwelling in your soul. Not have you truly a child of the kingdom. You see... The work of the Spirit comes through faith in Jesus Christ, through believing in who Jesus Christ is, God come in the flesh to seek and to save that which is lost, God come in the flesh to fulfill all righteousness, to live the law out faithfully that you have broken, to satisfy divine justice through the shedding of blood, His blood, Christ's blood on the cross, that atonement would be made, that your guilt might be removed, that you might be pardoned, rising from the dead after dying on the cross. 
If we haven't believed in this Jesus, we haven't yet experienced this grace, we are yet outside of this kingdom, this rule, this realm. And this kingdom not only has a king, and not only does it have a subject, our hearts, but it also has statutes. It has laws. Where are these statutes and laws to be found? They're to be found in the Scriptures. They're to be found in the Scriptures. They can be summed up, essentially, as law and gospel. But we, are, we, are, we find for sure that the work of the Spirit in our hearts writes the law upon our hearts. And what is the law? That we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and our neighbor as ourself. It's remarkable, isn't it, that God in His great wisdom can give us ten words that we can all memorize to help us to remember one word, love. Because that's really what it's all about. What is the sum of the law? Love. Love for God, love for your neighbor. And when the Spirit of God takes up residence in our hearts, when Christ becomes enthroned in our souls, when we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become new creation, the law of God is written upon our hearts. Such that before we didn't want to love God, we hated God, but now we want to love God. Before we cared less about our neighbors, but now we want to love our neighbors. And we have the Scriptures to guide us, to direct us as citizens of the kingdom, to live for the King. We have a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we hunger more and more to understand the breadth of the Word of God, the depth of the Word of God, the wonder of the Word of God. And we will never be done plumbing the great depths of the Holy Scriptures, the revelation of God to us. For here is God's Word to us that we might know Him and love Him and live for Him through believing in His Son. How are you doing in your love for the Word of God? How are you doing in your studying of the Word of God? How are you doing in your obeying the Word of God? Brothers and sisters, it's clear evidence of the work of the Spirit in our lives when we have a hunger and a thirst for the Scriptures, when we have a desire to know more of God through His Word. This is the work of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit that has changed us from being enemies of God to being children of God. We know that we have passed from death to life, from darkness to light, when we desire to know and learn the truths of the Word of God. And then there is a beauty, and there is an order to this rule of God in our hearts. I want you to think about this for a moment. I stole this from a particular Baptist who preached on this text in the 1750s. Samuel Stennett, who I'm doing a little bit of work on right now, was a fourth-generation particular Baptist in London, and he wrote three volumes. They're going to be published, Lord willing, over the next couple of years, and I'm going to be writing some stuff in connection with him. Um, and he preaches a sermon on 1 Corinthians 4.20 on the whole issue of the, the kingdom of God. And it was really him that gave me this idea where he, he speaks to the issue of the work of the Spirit bringing beauty and order to the heart. And I like this. This is a wonderful thing to consider, right? In our natural state, before we're converted to Christ, our hearts are disordered. They're out of whack with God. There's anarchy in our souls. There's rebellion in our souls. There's, there's disaffection towards God in our souls. There's, there's hatred and confusion towards God in our souls. But grace changes all that. The work of the Spirit changes all that. There is a beginning to put together a beauty and an order in our minds and in our hearts and in our choices that brings glory and honor to God. Now think about that. For those of you who've had dramatic conversions, maybe. Some of you who had deep addictions, perhaps. Some of you who had rather wayward lives. 
compared to some of us who grew up in Christian homes where our sins were restrained. They were still there, but they were just different. You know, don't you, how there was a time when you were out of your mind towards God. You had no time to think about God. There was hatred. There was, there was disdain. Those of us who grew up in Christian homes, we had enmity towards God, but it was a subtle kind of enmity. You know, it was, it was a, if there's such a thing, a nice enmity, right? Yours was a clearly hateful enmity. God came by His Spirit and made you new creation. And what did He begin to do? He began to give you a new mind. Renew your mind transform your mind, settle your mind towards your Creator, towards your God. There was this, this, you began to think lovely thoughts about God where you once thought terrible thoughts about God. There was a beauty began to emerge, an order. Very same for your will. You, you know very well that there was a time in your life where you just, you wanted to do whatever would offend God. God came by His Spirit, and He made you a new creation, and you said, hold on. I want to order my life after the ways of God. I want to have a life that is orderly and, and is, is beautiful in the sight of God. That's the work of the Spirit. That's the work of grace. You can't conjure that up. You can't do that for yourself. Only God can do it. And your affections were transformed. Oh, there was a time you hated God. The very name of Christ made you angry. God subdued you. God wooed you. God changed you. And now, oh, the name of Jesus in your ears is altogether beautiful. The name of Jesus is altogether wonderful. You love the name of Jesus. And you hate it when someone takes that name in vain. When someone uses that name as a curse word. Because you see, the Spirit of God who's brought you into the kingdom of God is now reordering your thinking, reordering your, your affections, reordering your choices to be conformed to the will of God, the way of God. Samuel Stennett, my new friend, whom I'm reading, says it's not perfect, this beauty and this order in our minds and in our hearts. It's not perfect. He says this, there are still Canaanites in the land. There is still the remains of ignorance, passion, and sin. And we all know that, don't we, if we're Christians? But then he goes on to say this, and it's an excellent observation, and I've been pondering this. He says this, However, in proportion to the influence of true Christianity on the heart, so is the beauty, health, and vigor of the mind. Let me give you that again in proportion to the influence of true Christianity on the heart, so is the beauty, health, and vigor of the mind. I think what he's saying there is this, that as you appropriate more the truth of Christ to your soul by faith through the power of the Spirit, so then beauty and order begin to emerge more in your thinking, in your choosing, and in your loving. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, does that not encourage you to have communion with Jesus? Does that not encourage you to have fellowship with the Lord? You see the wonder of grace here. You see the beauty of Christ, how He comes, and how He draws us, and how He changes us, and how He wants to reorder our thinking, and, and transform our wills, and, 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 and affect our affections. And how wonderful is the grace of God. If you've tasted something of that, you can be confident. You've passed from death to life. You've passed from darkness to light. You are a child of God. If you know something of that reality, that is the grace of God. No natural man ever would conjure up such realities. Your reverence towards God is transform, has transformed your thinking. Your heart is submitted towards His will. You want to do it uh, with all the battles that that is. Your affections now are delighting in Him where you once disdained Him. God is renewing you. He's changing you. 
He's bringing order and beauty to your soul. That's the kingdom of God. That's the rule of God in your life. That brings us to the fifth consideration, the blessings connected to the kingdom. There are blessings being a child of God and being in the kingdom of God. I want to encourage you with three tonight. I want you to see that as the ministry of the Spirit brings you to life and unites you with Christ, you now enjoy the favor of God. Of all the peoples in the world, if you're a child of God, you enjoy the favor of God. You are the object of God's favor. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I just lost my job this week. Well, Pastor, my health right now is really tanked. Ah, but you see, we're not talking about favor necessarily that your circumstances are all good. We're talking here about the favor of God to preserve your soul. The favor of God to recover you when you fall. The favor of God to restore you when you trip. The favor of God to get you back up when you go down. We're talking about the favor of God that preserves your faith even when it's burning low. To strengthen your heart when you are weak. We're talking about that kind of favor. That's the work of the Spirit. That's the ministry of the Spirit. Have you never had the experience where you know in your heart you've got no interest in reading the Word of God? But you know you need to do it, so you do it. And as you read, you want to read. And as you read more, you want to read more. That's the Spirit of God. That's the favor of God. That's God coming and bringing restoration, renewal, we enjoy the favor of God. We enjoy the presence of God in our lives. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You ever ponder that? You ever think about that? Actually regenerated by the Spirit of God, we enjoy the presence of God always. Wherever you go, whether you're in the workplace, whether you're on the train, whether you're heading to the airport, whether you're sitting at home, the reality is that you have the presence of God with you always because you have the Spirit of God in you always by the grace of God. So you're never alone. I think that's a great help to those who struggle with loneliness. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it is a help, isn't it, to know you may not have the physical presence of your brothers and sisters when you head home tonight to your apartment or to your home on your own, but you are not alone, for God is with you. Because Christ is in you by the Spirit. And that is a blessing that only a child of God has, that only a child of God knows, to know the presence of God. It is a favor from the Lord. There is a sweetness from the Lord. And what do you find? You find that He will protect you. There is this protection that God has, the blessing of His protection, that having begun that good work in you, even though you struggle, even though you trip, even though you fall, He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Life can be hard, can't it? It can be painful. It can be discouraging. It can be difficult. Some of you, you're facing bereavements right now in your families. Others of you, you're facing difficulties at your work. Some of you, your health is not what you would like it to be. And as the outer man fades and breaks down, and as circumstances are difficult, yet your soul is being renewed daily by the Spirit of God who dwells in you, brothers and sisters. And that protection will be there all the way through death, right into heaven. Having begun a good work in you, He will complete it. You will never be lost. And even though there'll be a day where we'll put this body off, ah, the inner man, the soul of man, because of the Spirit's presence, will bring us home. There are blessings connected to this kingdom of God. Blessing of God's favor. You're the object of His love. You're the recipient of His goodness in ways that the unbeliever is not. His presence. You never have to think that you're alone. 
if you're indwelt by the Spirit of God and His protection. Even though you may die, yet shall you live because of Jesus Christ. He's going to bring you safely home to glory. That brings us then to the last thing I want us to consider before we come to the supper. You see, what we have right now, it's really only a foretaste of what's coming. It's really only the first fruits of what is yet to be for us. Our enjoyment of the kingdom of God right now, the rule of God in our hearts, is the inaugural phase of God's redemptive purpose, right? There's a consummation coming. There's a consummate phase yet to take place at the return of our Savior, or if we enter glory, our soul certainly will be perfected until the day of resurrection. And so I want you to recognize then the stability and the certainty of this kingdom of God, this rule of God in your heart, the stability and the certainty of it. God's work of grace in your heart that enthrones Christ in your soul it's built upon an eternal foundation. You know why? Because it's built upon an eternal covenant. A covenant of redemption between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All that the Father has given to him will come to him, and he who comes to him will in no wise be cast out. The wonder of the grace of God is this that it was destined for you before the world began to pluck you out of the world to bring you to the world to come. And it cannot fail because it is God's covenant commitment. And I want to think, make you th think about that tonight because I think sometimes we can, we can get discouraged and we can, we can be fearful and anxieties can rise up and we can, we can wonder what is God doing and where is it all going and how should we react? Listen, from before the foundation of the world, God chose you in Christ to be his own. Well, if he chose you from before the foundation of the world to be his own, you don't have to worry. You're going to be there in the new heavens, the new earth. This kingdom work that has now begun in your heart, this, this work of God's rule in your soul to make you a new creation, to bring you from the depths of sin into the glories of righteousness, it is a work that is stable and certain and it cannot fail because it's God's work. You didn't make yourself a Christian. God made you a Christian. And if God made you a Christian, you can't unchristian yourself. How wonderful is the grace of God in our hearts that this work of grace has begun and that it is stable and that it is certain even when we seem so unstable and so uncertain. And we are, aren't we? We can be exhilarated tonight in the sermon and tomorrow morning wonder if we're even saved. Just as well, it doesn't depend on us, this glorious gospel. When I visited my dear brother Joe in the hospital just a week ago, I reminded him, and he was just concerned about struggling to read, struggling to remember. I said to him, brother, worry not. It's not about how well you've got a hold of God. It's about how well God's got a hold of you. And God's got an eternal hold of you if you're a child of God. And he's working out his purposes in this kingdom of stability and certainty. Oh, the world is not stable. The world is not certain in many ways. But God is. God is. God's purpose in Christ cannot fail. It will not fail. And you need not worry about it. You can trust Him. You can rest in Him. He is bringing you to an eternal kingdom. So let me ask you, are you living with an eternal perspective? Are you living with an eye towards eternal glory? I fear that sometimes I live with only an eye towards tomorrow or only an eye towards Thursday, or only an eye towards next Tuesday, 
That's not an eternal perspective. Now, the reality is you have to live with an eye towards Tuesday and an eye towards next Thursday or whatever because it depends what you're doing and you've got appointments and you've got responsibilities, right? But, but as Christians, we should zoom out and we should keep an eye on the big picture, upon the sovereign God, upon the eternal purpose of God, upon the reality that this kingdom that we have received by the Spirit of God that has made us new creations, it is a kingdom that cannot fail and is coming in all its fullness when Jesus comes in his glory. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the White House or what's going on in 10 Downing Street or Buckingham Palace. What matters is what's going on in our hearts as we look to God and what God is doing through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the rule of his spirit and the heart. And we know the end. I was chatting with someone just recently about this. We were chatting about some of the challenges of this world that we face. And why, how do we navigate through it? How do we get through these things? We lift up our eyes and we behold Christ on his throne. And we know that he is ruling in our hearts by his spirit. And he's bringing us through this world to eternal glory. And that we are part of a kingdom that, is, that cannot be shaken because it's the kingdom of God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as we come tonight to the Lord's Supper, let us be very clear about something. We're not about mere religion in this, in this church. We're not about mere words, mere talk. We are about the power of God in our hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit. We're about the rule of God in our lives by His grace. And in a day when there is so little manifestation, it seems, of God's power to be found in the church, that it's all talk more than power, the work of the Spirit, let us be a people who are concerned about the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in us, the work of the Spirit in us together, the work of the Spirit as we take the gospel forward. You see, true Christianity it's about God's power to save us, and God's power to work in us, and God's power to transform us, and God's power to bring us to glory through faith in His Son. Yes, the kingdom of God has come, and it is yet to come. Let us, by grace, look to the King and rejoice in all that is ours, as children of the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider the work of your grace in our hearts by your Spirit through faith in your Son, we marvel that we are children of the living God and we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We thank you, Father, for the work of your Spirit that has brought us from death to life to believe in your Son. We thank you for the means of grace that you've given to us to strengthen faith and to work repentance that we might be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. We pray tonight, Father, as we come uh, to the Lord's Supper that you would be with us. We pray that you would draw near to us. We pray that we would benefit from this means of grace. We pray, Lord, as we reaffirm our covenant commitments to one another as your people that you would draw near to us and be glorified in and through our lives. Write your word upon our hearts tonight, Lord. Correct the disorderly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Strengthen the weak. Be glorified amongst us. For Jesus' sake, amen.